21 years ago, uh, a young couple, Jeremy and Lori Hosworth, uh, connected with Grace Church for the first time, and for the last 21 years, they have participated in the life of the church, in the mission of the church, and uh, their family is going to be uh, relocating. Um, the kids have already begun school in a, a different school district, and some time back, the, the elders uh, decided that it would be really valuable to have uh, Jeremy, who's been our deacon of congregational care for the last 12 years here at Grace and served very effectively and faithfully in that role. We, uh, we thought it'd be valuable to have him come and open the word so that we could hear him teach. So would you help me to welcome Jeremy Hosworth. Well, I wasn't expecting that. I thought Tim just wanted a day off. Um, we, should, we should welcome pastors with applause every time they come up. I think that's... Well, good morning, Grace, and for those of you online, um, and for anyone I haven't met, uh, my name is Jeremy, and uh, if any of you out there had any doubt about the faith of Pastor Tim and the Elder Board, well, doubt not, because they gave this guy the mic. <laughs> oh, my family and I have been a part of Grace now for more than 20 years. Um, and when Pastor Tim first asked me to preach today, uh, I considered uh, going back and, and trying to, to, to culminate all of that time and, and put it together. And uh, I quickly realized that I was going to ramble and probably cry and, and nobody wants to see that. So, uh, so that's out. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to ask you two questions at the start today. And we're going to talk for a while. I'm not really going to answer those two questions, which is maybe why I don't work in public education. Um, and I'm going to try to work through those without many, making any jokes about goats, um, which for those of you who know me well, may be very difficult. Um, and then we're going to focus through that time on our Christian identity. Um, but before we dive in, let's commit this time to the Lord. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to be your servant, God, in all things. I, I thank you for, the, for bringing us all here, each one of us today, for bringing those people online uh, to this spot in their computer, for, for putting us where we are in, in each of our lives, Lord. I just ask that you take whatever words that I've written down that you don't want and get rid of them, Lord. Just make this your time. Speak through the time we have together, and just make this about you, Lord, and glorify yourself in the process. In your precious name, amen. All right, Stella, you got a slide for me? The, the screenshot. I worked through it. Hey, I, I told Stella if she had dancing chickens on the screen, I'd still preach. Um, so the inspiration for this message started quite a while back uh, during a conversation with my 15-year-old daughter, Linnea. So now, in my family, in eighth grade, that's when we issue children cell phones. No, we don't give them phones. We issue them. They've come to understand this, that, that just like the state police issues me uh, equipment that they can take back, inspect, look at, do whatever they want with, and just keep if they want. We issue children cell phones the same way. Um, and we can do whatever we want with them. So, Linnea had her cell phone. She's a track practice or somewhere. And they don't call, right? Sends me a text message. And are you guys familiar with autocorrect? Love autocorrect, right? It's that lovely program. It tries to, it tries to read your mind and put out what it thinks you want to say. Well, at 15, of course, Linnea doesn't have a car. I was her ride. I'm like, a, I'm like an underpaid Uber. Um, 
You notice your kids don't tip, right? <laughs> so she's sending her message, right? And what she meant to say in this text message is, because she's a practice, she needs a, she needs a ride, and of course she's impatient. And she says, she wants to say, Dad, where are you? Right? But autocorrect jumps in. Super helpful. It pops in and says, who are you? Is the message I get on my phone. I'm a... <laughs> so I'm a good dad, right? I know what she meant. So I, 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 I respond appropriately for what she sent. And I says, I says, some people call me the space cowboy. <laughs> Some call me the gangster of love. <laughs> My poor kids. <laughs> Pray for them. <laughs> Who are you? We've written songs about it. There's books about it. This question of identity is bounced around and messed up in society all over the place. Who are you? Seems like a simple answer, right? But if I claim Christ as my Savior, if I think the Bible speaks truth and the promises of God hold true in my life, I first have to answer another question. Who is Jesus? before I can possibly begin to answer the question of who I am. So we're going to try that. Please turn with me to Matthew 16. We're going to go through verses 13 through 16. If you've got a Bible app, you can tap your way through it. I love my Bible app. It's my abs Okay, I do use the mapping program a lot, I've got to admit. But I love my Bible app. Uh, my only... My only hope would be that they would add that sound effect of turning pages when you go through it. I love the sound of turning pages. They do it with phones, or the, the pictures, right? Sounds like whining film. I think they could do it. So a little context about this verse. Just before this point in the book of Matthew, Jesus is healing the sick. He's fed the crowd some fish and bread. And then he had the Pharisees and Sadducees demanding a sign. And Jesus gave warning to the disciples about them. And then we come to this pivotal point in Matthew 13. It says, Now when Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I can picture Jesus hanging out with his disciples, and he sort of drops this one on them. He's like, Hey, what's the buzz on Twitter about me? What are folks saying? Now, I don't for a moment think that Jesus didn't know. He, I mean, he knew what people were saying. He knew what the disciples were thinking. And I don't, I don't think he was looking to fish for flattery. That, that doesn't fit with Jesus' character. Um, kind of like when you ask your kids where the chocolate chips went. Do you really not know the answer? Right? But Jesus always has a purpose. So he gets what some of the gossip is about him, and of course that's all wrong, right? He's not any of these prophets reimagined or any of those sorts of things. And of course, who answers up? Peter's right there. Boom! I can almost see him like that kid in class, like, I got the answer, I got the answer, I got the answer. About ready to pop. You're the Christ! Boom. Hey, you got the right answer. That's a big deal. And this is an important moment then for the disciples, right? It's after this confession that Jesus begins revealing more to the disciples. Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. They, need, he need, they needed that faith, that 
You are the Christ. So even though this question was posed to the disciples more than 2,000 years ago, it's the same question each one of us has to answer for ourselves today. We can't, the, we can't answer, who am I, without first answering, who is Jesus? And Jesus doesn't give us an out on this one. By not engaging the question or just ignoring the question, you've still made a decision. It's like when your app tells you to turn left and you keep driving, you've made a decision. You're going the wrong way. So either Jesus is who he says he is or he's not in your life. Either he's the son of the living God, Jehovah, creator of the universe, Lord of your life, or he isn't. There isn't a halfway. There's no sideline option for the answer. You don't get to have it both ways. And the way that Jesus posed the question also hasn't changed over 2,000 years. People still respond to it the same way. People say, oh, he was a good guy. He was a prophet. He was a pretty good teacher. And those things are a start, but they miss the mark. Once you come to grips with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who died for you and me for the forgiveness of our sins. He lived a life I couldn't and died a death for me so that I didn't have to die a death eternally. Once you come to grips with that, it changes who you are. Like the Apostle Paul said in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anybody is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. The fact that we can be saved by grace through faith, it's incredible. So if I accept Christ and his lordship in my life, through prayer and study of the word, Jesus is going to reveal more to himself as I listen and become in tune to the voice of God. It's also going to have a profound effect on who I am. Once we come to grips with this, with who Jesus is, we can start to work on that answer. Okay, who am I? Who am I in Christ? Because that's the biggest part about what we're talking about today. If you don't accept Christ for who he is, and you don't have a relationship with him, then having an identity in Christ doesn't make a lot of sense. If you haven't surrendered your life to Christ... Uh, then it simply doesn't make sense for you to want to have your world colored by what he taught. You can choose to have a life grounded in truth or not. Christian identity starts and ends with Christ. So this question of who are you is one that uh, we can answer in a lot of ways. So in my uh, brief time working, I've been a police officer, I've been... Uh, student, I've been a logger, I've been a milkman, I've been a goat farmer, um, I've been lots of things. I can, I, can, I can take that and just wrap it up. Being, a, being a, a police officer now is one of those identity jobs that just sort of can suck you right in and like be everything. And it's easy for your occupation to dominate your identity. Our society reinforces that. But if I define myself simply by what I do, I'm going to really struggle with retirement, if I make it that far. I'm going to really struggle with retirement anyway. That's, that's a fact. But if I let that define me, if that's it, when I, get, when I retire, when I quit, when I get fired, then what? What do I got? If people see me only in the role I fill, um, what do I have left? But if I, if I live my life in those identities through Christ, they're going to have meaning. They're gonna ha I'm going to have more than just me. It's more than I can just offer myself because I'm limited. Christ, is Christ limited? Am I, am I better off relying on just what Jeremy's got to give, or, or should I tap into an ever-living God 
that loves me? I've got to ask myself that question sometimes because I'm tempted to just tap into what Jeremy's got. So early this year, I had the privilege of conducting a funeral for a woman I had met at Christian Park. Um, we used to visit with her, spent lots of time with her at the end of her life. And then her family says, hey, would you conduct her funeral? I said, wow, absolutely. I didn't, didn't hesitate for a minute. So if you want to get to know somebody really well, do their funeral. <laughs> wow. Um, and I had only known Rita as an older woman. Um, by that time, her legs had been amputated from diabetes, and, and she was wheelchair-bound. Um, but what I knew about Rita, even in the nursing home, was this is a woman who loved Jesus. And then as I talked with her family, and I researched those times in her life about different roles she'd played and different jobs she'd had and the impact that she had on different people, that thread was so pronounced. She lived a life that was defined by her love of Christ. And that's what identified her through whatever place she was and what she was doing. So what defines you? Who are you really? Is it your job? Is it a disease? Is it your car, your truck, sports, hobbies? Um, anything short of an identity in Christ can be taken from you, and then what? So if I get fired tomorrow, which if you hear me talk at work is not far-fetched, it will be lame. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm not going to try to get fired. But it's not going to destroy me. It doesn't take from me my identity. It simply takes my vocation. I'll go find another job. If I can't ride my motorcycle tomorrow, it's going to make me sad. Okay, it'll make me very sad. Okay. But is that my identity? It's something I do. My faith is in a God who loves me, not my stuff. If I put my stuff in a place where Jesus should be, I've created an idol. And I'm allowing my identity to be defined by something other than a savior. Remember the Roman centurion with the sick servant from Luke? Luke 7, 1 through 10. So that'll be our next verse. So this Roman centurion, the same story is also in the book of Matthew. So if it sounds familiar, you'll know why. So this is one of my, this is a, a favorite story of mine. And it's up on the screen if you want to follow along, or you can turn and tap with me to Luke 7, 1 through 10, and we'll read there. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a sick servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And they went to Jesus, and they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does this. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them. And he turned, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So we're introduced to him by his job title, which is a pretty important one back in the day. And I can relate to the centurion's job description. They were a mid-level commander in the Roman army. They were in charge of between 80 and 100 
soldiers, depending on where you read. So they're a mid-level muckety-muck. They have logistical and managerial responsibilities, but they still get their hands dirty. So ponder this. Here we have a Roman centurion, a member of the military occupying force in Israel. He's presumably a Gentile, and he wields considerable power and authority in his neighborhood. But what defines him is his faith. It's written that Jesus marveled at his faith. This centurion shows love for the people of Israel. He's made it possible for them to build their synagogue. He's loved by his Jewish neighbors. It's written that they earnestly pleaded with Jesus on his behalf. That's not, that's not how you describe someone who's just casually asking, hey, if you get a chance in the neighborhood, you want to swing by. No, they love this guy. They earnestly plead with Jesus, hey. And he, this centurion, this Roman soldier occupying Israel has the faith to reach out to Jesus, not for himself, but to heal his servant. He understood he needed somebody beyond just him, that his power alone wasn't going to get it done. And he understood authority. And he understood that Jesus was the one with the authority to heal. And the miraculous healing that followed this encounter with Christ was no less miraculous than the faith that came before. He knew who Jesus was, and it defined who he was. What we do is going to have an impact on who we are. It will touch it. They're like fingerprints on our lives. They say, I've done, I've done a lot of stuff. Worked in the woods. I've worked on farms. Been a husband, a father taught college, I've done lots of stuff. And each one of those things touches me and tweaks a bit of my personality. Some people say it's tweaked it hard. <laughs> but in Christ, I'm a new creation, right? All those things are things I do, but Christ defines who I am. When we surrender to Christ, he influences everything we do and redefines who we are. So in my mind, messed up as it is, I think, I think of it like a big spiritual coffee filter. Now maybe I drink too much coffee. But <laughs> everything I do is touched. You know, the coffee filter works and it filters through and it keeps out those grounds and funky things and it just, but it touches every bit of that water that goes into that pot. And, and Christ does that for me. The situation and some crises and life, they all come together and they filter through that. It's a life that's, that's touched by Christ. Some people carry a physical reminder. They'll put a little, those, those WWJD bracelets from two decades ago or three decades ago. Some, hey, if it's that, that thing that touches, like, hey... If I have a spiritual filter, if I have a, if a mental thought, or if it's a physical reminder, the important thing is that surrender to Christ. That I'm going to let it. I'm going to let Him touch everything. It's going to affect how I run a post. It's going to affect how I drive. I've seen some of you drive. <laughs> It's going to touch how I parent my children. It's going to touch everything I do. It's going to be colored. It's going to be filtered through that, that lens of Christ. It isn't natural for me of myself to want to go work at a Bible camp or to go to India and, 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 and give time or sacrifice my time. But when you have a life that's touched and filtered through Christ, that's what, 
those are the things you do. You think about what, what does my life look like as a, as a Christian, as what Jesus wants me to do. So does this mean I'm going to be perfect? Yep, she says yes. No. <laughs> Don't ask Lori about that one, okay. No, no, you're not going to be perfect, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be sinless. Please don't give an amen to that. Um, remember Peter? Remember, remember our guy Peter? You're the Christ. He knew it. Boldly proclaimed. Denied Christ three times when he was crucified. Not sinless. But what did, what did Jesus do with Peter after? He still used him in mighty ways in the kingdom. Mighty ways building the kingdom of God. So he can use an imperfect vessel to do amazing things when you rely and color your identity through the person of, of Jesus Christ. So we can still fail, which is good, because I do, but we can still be used in amazing ways for the glory of God. We serve a God who forgives us when we come up short. Some of us more often than others. But acknowledging Christ for who he is makes me want to follow him. Encountering Christ stamps itself on your life and makes me want him to have a greater influence on everything I do and how I live my life. It makes me want the definition of who I am filtered through a lens of a holy God. So I'll close with this. Who is Jesus and who are you? Would you please pray with me? Lord God, I thank you so much for the chance to open your word. God, thank you for using imperfect vessels like me and like each one of us, God, that we can rely on a perfect and holy God who loved us enough to send his son to live a perfect life that we can't live, but that we can rely on you, Lord. Thank you so much for bringing us here today, for speaking to our lives, for giving us this place to be, and for saving us, Lord. Please guide us, help us to seek you out in everything we do, through this day, through our week, and through our time together. I thank you for Grace Church, Lord, and the impact it's had on my life. I thank you for the work you do through this church and for everyone in this building and out in the world. Lord, thank you, God, so much. Please guide us and keep us, and it's in your precious and holy name we pray.